Hello, everyone, and let's get started. So good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Business Bites. I hope everyone is having a wonderful Wednesday. And I thank you all for joining us for our second Business Bites of 2021. Uh, so as a small introduction, my name is Brian Lay. I am from Hannah House, Newport Beach, uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all. Uh, I do see that we have some participants trickling in right now and some new registrations. So as a little bit of background, Business Bites is a collaboration between Hannah House and Honest Access. Honest Access is an innovation and consulting firm, and Hannah House is a flexible co-working space and cafe in two locations, one in Palo Alto and one in Newport Beach. Newport Beach is right behind me. Uh, our space is cl currently closed due to pandemic, but we will continue to operate and provide very insightful events such as business fights um, free for every month. Um, so follow both of our social medias to stay updated uh, and keep updated with our events coming out. Uh, some housekeeping items. We encourage you all to check out um, check our website and YouTube channel for the re uh, recording of Business Bites. So this is gonna be recorded um, and sent out via email to our registrations. We'll also provide a survey link at the end for any feedback that you may have to help us improve our future sessions. Uh, those feedbacks are very important to us. So thank you so much for filling that out. Um, with all that being said, um, I would now like to hand it over to Kelly from Honest Access as today's moderator and welcome our amazing panelists for uh, today's session. Thank you and enjoy. Thank you so much, Brian. I'm Kelly O'Connell, and it's an absolute pleasure to be joined by this group of business and strategy experts today to talk about one of my favorite conversations, planning while maintaining change agility. And so we'll be discussing in today's virtual Business Bite session, the very specific conversation around the role of the strategic plan in the face of the changes that many organizations experienced in 2020. Uh, I am uh, thrilled to be participating as the moderator today, but we have an esteemed panel, and I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to them to give them the opportunity to introduce themselves. So beginning with you, Kev, I'd love for you to uh, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your background and where you're from. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I am Kev Kayat. I am born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. I spent about 25 years in Britain, in the UK, working across uh, health, social care, and education in um, large strategic initiatives, doing um, dozens of change projects. I returned to Cleveland in 2012 to work at the Cleveland Clinic and then the Cleveland Schools. And I've just this last uh, autumn returned to the UK. So it's 8 p.m. here, actually. Um, but I uh, coach and uh, uh, consult with nonprofits primarily um, on uh, a range of issues, but primarily to focus on their impact, uh, starting obviously with strategy and following through with their uh, income plans and their programs and HR and uh, all the other pieces that you need. So thank you for uh, um, inviting me to, to participate today. Well, thank you very much, Kev. Eliza. Hey, everybody. Uh, I am Eliza Delgado. I am the Chief Operating Officer of Rich Cardona Media. We are a um, personal branding uh, agency, and we produce content for uh, C-suite executives, founders, and, uh, and uh, entrepreneurs. So um, that's our business, um, you know, through Rich Cardona Media. My background is over 20 years in, you know, operations, biz dev, publishing, marketing, sales. I've been across all kinds of verticals. Um, so I bring with me to this startup environment um, a significant amount of that experience uh, in, in helping to scale this organization. Uh, we are just under two years old, so I'm living the startup life, which is pretty different from living at scale in the Fortune 500 and up. Um, but uh, it's really interesting kind of bringing all that down to scale and then applying all that knowledge from startup to scale uh, across all the businesses that we serve and the, the organizations that we work with. So it's an honor to be here and I'm, I'm happy to contribute to this conversation. Thank you so much. Tina. 
Yes, hello. Thank you, Kelly. My name is Tina Fox McCord, and I'm in San Diego, California, where it's nice and sunny. Um, and I'm currently the Director of Integration and Innovation for Raw Staffing. I get asked a lot, what do you do? What does that mean? And basically, my job is to assist our organization through business transformation. So technical deployments and um, integrations, as well as always working to create more efficient ways to do better business practices, strategic planning, and do that through innovation. So of course, in turn, we um, get the business trinity, which is reducing the costs and continue to improve operations and also drive revenue. Um, another way a lot of people like to ask what that is, is I connect the dots between the end user, our customer experience and corporate initiatives and work through that change management. I actually was formerly an accountant by trade. Um, many people said you had too much personality for an accountant. So I ended up in staffing being recruited and I never looked back. 20 years later, I'm still in staffing. I still have a passion for it. We find people jobs and do career development. So it's just fascinating and very rewarding. Um, I worked many years in the field before I made a transition to corporate operations, and that's where I thrive now, and I love that I personally can connect the dots um, as well as my organization. I'm a number one best-selling author for a woman's book, which was a fun endeavor I, I decided to do, and also the president of our current local chapter for the Accounting and Finance Women's Association, and I used to be a trainer for Dress for Success um, for the ladies there. So I think most people would know me for my contagious energy and also my compassion and empathy for people who are less fortunate and in need, um, but I also practice yoga and believe in the power of intention. So I have to have a mantra and I can't leave the call without giving it to you. My personal mantra is just be you, choose happy in all things and keep your face to the sun guys because you'll never walk in the shadows. So thank you for letting me be here today. Well, thank you all. I think if we were to end the call right now, just from this, this brief introduction, uh, everybody would take away something, which is part of why we created this Business Bites series, is to give back and connect to the community. And certainly over the last 12 plus months, uh, many people have been faced with uh, change that's both been dramatic and persistent, which is a combination that impacts people uh, directly and indirectly. And one of the things that makes me very excited in this conversation today is each of our experts brings uh, professional experience and personal passion for community. And you bring experience from a different perspective. And so we've got, you know, Fortune 500, startup, nonprofit, media. We have uh, both U.S. and U.K. expertise. And so as we move forward in this conversation, I'm really excited uh, to hear your authentic responses to these very important topics. Uh, one note about the Business Bite series is this is a series where we're trying to create dialogue with our audience. So if you're on, please feel free to use the chat. Uh, engage with Shelly, who's hosting as a moderator in our chat, um, and we'll give you plenty of time at the end of this conversation to ask questions, uh, but certainly engage with us as we're going along uh, because your opinions and expertise also matter to us. That said, um, really excited to begin our discussion today with uh, one of our preset questions, uh, which is something that I hear frequently while working with organizations and leaders, um, which is, is, is there still a role for the strategic plan while change is happening? How do, I, how do I plan for the future while everything keeps shifting under me? Um, and as I reach out to these panelists, I'm gonna begin with asking if there's a business that you feel has navigated this changing landscape particularly well, and if you can share what stands out about their approach, which may serve to help those leaders who are asking that really important question about what the role of change is in a changing landscape. And I'll start off with you, Eliza, on this one. Oh my gosh. Well, first of all, I, I really, I had to think deeply about this, but for me um, and my perspective and the different organizations that I serve, um, you know, I've seen a couple of different things. One from a very niche perspective, um, one of my clients, they are, they own a franchise 
of you know children's dance studios. So basically they thrived in this environment, one, because they were prepared, prepared with a digital curriculum that could be deployed mm -hmm. instantly. Um, so all they really had to invest in was additional curriculum um, modules um, for kids to be able to stay active at home outside of the school environment. So they were able to launch a subscription model that was really effective for them. Um, and then the other thing is, um, you know, just I think in general, personal branding agencies like our business did really exceedingly well because people recognize the need to be visible and create branding that then drives traffic in the digital environment. So really anything that translated digitally was really, really key, um, no matter the industry. I think the other things um, that I've discovered are really just the intentionality of building out a strategy that allows you to leverage those key factors of the unknown, having contingency plans. If everything went away, what could I really stand on that people would want for me? And have I done enough to be putting that in front of the market now? Um, so that really is universal across any industry, any size of organization from startup to scale. I think the people that were able to stay ahead of the curve in terms of, I can't plan every single unforeseen thing that could potentially come my way, but I wanna be prepared. Um, that's really been the organizations that have won no matter the industry and no matter the size. Um, so for me, my personal example is just that client of ours, um, but a lot of our clientele also is military backed. Um, so they also are uh, you know, unbelievably prepared with contingency plans for contingency plans down to the nth degree. So you know, I think being able to forecast what you can't predict and creating some boundaries and strategies to make sure you have a safety net has always been um, you know, obviously a linchpin of business in general, but in light of the unforeseen, it's even more fundamental now. Thank you so much, Eliza. I think uh, that is such a, an important perspective. And I'm curious, uh, you mentioned that you feel like it applies ac across organizations of all sizes. Uh, working in innovation at a very large global organization, Tina, I'll hand this question over to you um, and, and ask you, what was your experience and is there an organization you think managed this landscape particularly well? Yeah, um, not because I work in the industry of staffing, but I do have to say that staffing had to make a, a tremendous change and pivot because not only did we have to manage how our internal employees were going to work through a remote workforce, but we also had clients who were coming to us saying, I need your help to get my employees to a virtual um, platform and a workforce. And then we had our candidates working for clients that we had to also deploy and get them in a remote workforce. So it was like a triple whammy for our industry. Um, a lot of time to pivot and get through that. And I think one of the things that stands out about the approach is, um, and it didn't even dawn on me until we start, I started thinking about this question. We're inherently a very reactive business by nature. And we're always in the forefront of technology to stay ahead and work through various um, obstacles because we don't inherently have our customers right in front of us at all times. Our candidates are working for our customers. We're hands off with that experience. So when I started thinking about this question, I started thinking, you know what, I think it's in the nature of what we were able to do came from reacting quickly to our customers demands and listening to what our customers were asking us specifically, and then being able to make sure that we maneuvered our strategy towards what the customer needed and what our coworkers internally needed from us. Um, and doing so that meant deploying some new technologies, being a little bit bold and saying, you know what, we thought about this before, now's the time to go ahead and integrate that. Um, get people through change management, get them over the fear to be courageous and go bold with those changes. So I think that's a great way to, to think about strategic plans is your objective handling and how are you on the reactive side of your business. Um, we're always so proactive in planning and proactive in our thoughts and delivery of strategy. But what about the reactive side and how do we respond and react to changes when they do happen? So I think some great things um, outside of the, the, the bad things that COVID has brought in the pandemic, I think there's some great new strategies that companies will be able to look at and be a little more bold in reacting to things and thinking, let's just do this. Let's try this technology. Let's sign a one-year contract. We'll learn at the end either way. Thank you so much, Tina. I love the, the carryover between the two answers about uh, the importance of 
how to respond, not necessarily the steps that we often think of uh, within a strategic plan, but uh, instead approach uh, as part of a strategic plan uh, and the pillars. Uh, I'd love to hear your perspective on this, Kev, and uh, an organization you think helps navigate this particularly well. Um, uh, I've got, yeah, I got a couple um, who um, were represented on um, some panels I was running actually through 2020, uh, specifically on nonprofit boards and, and strategy. And we asked this very, very, very specific question around um, what value strategic plans have. And it's always been, I think we always recognize that the, the organizations who do strategic planning as a task and put the strategic plan away, <laughs> only to dust it off again in the in the requisite cycle um, are always going to struggle and those that um, uh, use the sort of a soft metric I like to use is you know is the is the strategic plan real do the middle managers can they articulate it in their own words um, without any reference to any document whatsoever that that's the that's the sort of implementation because they can problem solve and uh, make decisions you know on the fly day to day and, and two organizations that, that seem to do this really, really well is a university settlement uh, in Slavic Village in, in Cleveland, which is uh, recognized as the epicenter of the financial crash from 2008 and, and the mortgage, subprime mortgage. And they, they shifted very quickly from a, um, the standards university settlement model, which is poverty alleviation, to a, um, to a uh, basically a, a survival uh, mode, uh, not just for the organization, but 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 for the community. But because they had cha challenged, sorry, they translated their strategic plan into practical day-to-day -day stuff that everybody understood. The best example I saw of of doing this really formally is actually in your neighborhood, um, Gregory Scott, who's the CEO. You might know him uh, at the. Um, Community Action Partnership of Orange County has a very formal process of, of, of sort of 10 year strategic plan and then a five year version of it and re, re, um, uh, me imagining that on an annual basis, and it's and it's very clear what his plans are. Uh, Tina, you mentioned intentionality. Um, that that's a very real um, important um, feature of of the successful nonprofit who can focus on their impact and what they're for. So when things like 2020 happen, <laughs> um, people don't lose sight of what their what their core purpose is, and so they can mm -hmm. they can adjust accordingly uh, because their plans are not sitting on a shelf. Thank you so much. I, I love that as we answered this, our panelists come from very different perspectives, very different industries, had no prep session together, and yet it was as if they were just continuing one another's uh, answer. Really, uh, the role of strategic plan and, and companies doing this well, uh, as I heard it from all of you, is that you have to have a clear vision and it needs to be actionable. And it needs to be actionable at all levels of an organization. And, and I love the idea, Kev, of it being real. Uh, as we think about that and it being real at all roles of an organization, then what role does leadership play in helping the organization to navigate through these unexpected changes? And Tina, we'll start with you on this question. Yeah, I think this is a great question. As people think of being a leader, what does that truly mean by definition? And I think somewhere in there, communication is really what it all boils down to, right? There's the, the guide, the coach, the mentor, but without communication, you truly can't um, be able to emphasize what that plan is, be able to strategically allow your coworkers and your customers to understand your plan. So I think it comes down to making sure to navigate unexpected changes through communication. And one thing our organization did, which I really was grateful for, was we were very clear with our communication. There was intent, there was honesty, and it was timely. Um, a lot of people in uncertainty go through fear and change management, right? So having a call every day at the same time provided consistency for them to navigate that change and allowed them to know that they had a free form to speak. And Kevin, I think you uh, or Kev, you mentioned also about, you know, the intention and the vision and the values, right? Our company is very strong on mission, vision, and values. And I think 
despite anything that happens, that's the core of who we are. And so that doesn't change and provides a little bit of some structure around that uncertainty and navigating those unexpected changes and provides familiarity for people. So through that communication, through making sure that we still do what we are and who we are as an organization, helping people and we don't lose sight of that, suddenly our strategic plan becomes a little clearer and a little easier to navigate through. And lastly, I think it's such an important skill and it's probably one of my favorite things I say to people. I was told once, Tina, seek to understand not to be understood. And I think that is key to any strategic plan. You have to understand what your employer needs from you, what you need from your employees, what your customers need from you, what your um, overall business strategic plan needs. And that's going to change. It may not change as drastic as we had in 2020, but it will evolve and it will change. Through. So clear communication with everyone and listening carefully with what is needed will definitely help guide you through that unexpected change and helping play that leadership role. Thank you so much, Tina. Uh, Kev, I'm going to hand this one to you since Tina, um, in her response, shared a little bit uh, from your last answer. I'd love to hear from your perspective what role leadership plays in helping an organization navigate. Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, I've got a really simple distinction that I, uh, wait, you, you mentioned like what does leadership mean in definition? And, and the one I use, um, it's not perfect by any means, but, but, um, uh, I find it, find it works for me in a lot of cases. So the way I distinguish um, leadership and management um, is that um, leadership is a one-to-many relationship uh, from the leader to, to the people being led, whereas management is the one-to-one. -one. Uh, and, and it's sort of in a team, if you're a manager of a team, you need to still get a one -to, on a one-to-one -one basis the best out of each person in your team. Um, and, and a leader, uh, in, in terms of leadership, um, I want to pick up what Tina said about listening. Uh, it's a one-to-money re relationship, um, but it goes in both directions. So the one-to-many is um, providing a consistent voice, uh, that consistent messaging, and shaping the vision and how you expect the organization to go on. So everybody hears the same thing. That's that's important to know that everybody's on the same, uh, in the same boat, going in the same direction. But also listening, and there are many voices to listen to, um, and that's an important feature to know how to model the experience that people are going to go through. Going through uncertainty uh, doesn't need to be as fearful and difficult as, as, it, as it can be. Uh, if people are allowed to make mistakes, they're allowed to take risks, they're allowed to learn, because that's really the only way we're gonna move forward. And it's important that leadership model that, and communicate that and support that so that people don't feel um, that they, they have to get absolutely everything right in a situation that they have never experienced before. So that's what I would say. Well, I love that, Kev. I think one of the um, phrases my team would say that I probably overused as we're coaching in this innovation space is that we're a safe to try work environment. And it's a safe to try work environment. And uh, I think it's spot on. I think, um, you know, the challenge of being a leader is being fixed in, in the idea that you have to present a consistent message, and that means a fixed message. And I think what you what you just shared helps to show the relationship between being consistent and allowing for authentic change through listening. Uh, and so, thank you for that. And Eliza, I'd love to hear your additional thoughts around this. Yeah, I love that. It's so funny because while Tina was talking and Kev was talking, I was like, "Yep, yep, yep." <laughs> um, <laughs> But I think bringing up the tail end of this, I think, you know, the leadership responsibility really is being the lighthouse and, you know, being the beacon of safety to shore for, for your team. And that really focuses around, I think, three core things, which is, you know, making sure that you are the calm and the reason and the safety that people have, which is kind of what Kev just talked about. Um, but then also that you are strategically communicating ahead of any concerns and taking people's fears and reflecting it back to them in a healthy way of, I hear you, this is how we're going to address X and Y and Z that has been reflected upwards towards me. Um, I think the worst thing that a leader can do is only have that one-way communication and risk losing the engagement from their staff because that is morale, that is all kinds of things that you put in jeopardy and you risk in the long game 
So uh, from a leadership perspective, it's making sure that you're the voice of calm, that you're the voice of wisdom, that you're consistent, and that you're ahead of the curve in terms of, hey, here's what we envision, but you're also being authentic and honest and saying, we don't know what that will look like, but we're going to do it together, and we're going to talk through it together, and we're going to make sure we're communicating the entire way. Um, I think, you know, impulse management and exp expectation management is a key component of leadership as well. Um, you know, not having the knee-jerk reaction of, of, you know, well, this happened and now we're going to do this as opposed to, hey, this happened. It's not ideal. Here's how we're going to maybe pivot slightly, but we still want to keep going along our strategic objective and try to see that through as much as possible, as long as it's a viable option. Um, and then, you know, being able to make the calls ad hoc as they come when it's necessary, but being that calm voice of consistency and wisdom and reason is just the essential component of that leadership. <clears throat> oh, thank you so much, Eliza. I think that one of the things I love about what you talked about is about being that consistent voice, um, the authenticity of that voice being important, um, but also recognizing that we get to be whole people at work. So one, that we do have an emotional reaction uh, to things, that we ourselves have fear and uncertainty and doubt, um, and not, not fixing that away, but instead finding a way to embrace that and to create tools as a leader to respond to that and not have that knee-jerk reaction, as you talked about it, I think is so essential to creating that safety and trust that you also talked about, um, which is a wonderful transition to our next question, uh, which I'll ask you, Kev, first. In the face of changes that directly impact strategic company vision or goals, how do you recommend that leaders address the shift in team priorities? So we have these circumstances. There's a plan going into the first quarter, going into the second quarter of 2020, and that plan has been upended by tremendous changes, quarantine, shelter in place. You run a restaurant and it no longer can seat people inside, a dance studio, and uh, you can no longer have – uh, students in class together. How do how do you, uh, Kev, have um, suggest that a company address those shifts in team priorities as part of that communication plan? So um, I, I'd say that there's 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 three shifts that you need to make, or three th three sort of perspectives. One is uh, that it's shorter, wider, and absolutely fixed. <laughs> and the the absolutely fixed is the is the as 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 Tina and Eliza would say is your is your mission values your purpose often being authentic who you are that that can't shift you're not going to redefine who you are um, and 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 it, you know and when people do have to make those sorts of pivots it's not because the whole environment's changing because then you you really are lost so that so the thing that you hold hold true to and solid is 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 that is that identity. What you bring, what, what's shorter is your, your strategic planning horizon. So you, you can't be looking three to five years out because we, no one can see that far. So you look at, you look at 12 months, you look at three to three, six months. What, what do we know and, and what can we say about it? What are some reasonable predictions? Well, you're not gonna get these right. So you also have to go wider and have maybe scenario A, scenario B, scenario C, which allows you to say, okay, we think we think it's going to go this way, but we have some options that that we've thought through. And because you're only looking a shorter period ahead, you can fill out some of those other options. And of course, you do this in a way which involves your team. Uh, it's it's explicit and transparent that you're having to do this because that's how you're going to bring people along. But those are the those are the three sort of perspectives I would take on it. Thanks, Kev. Eliza, I'll turn this one over to you. Oh man, I think there's various, you know, I think it depends on your business model. And I think it depends on how you've structured, structured your team. Um, it can look very, very differently depending on that organizational structure. If you have a very flat structure, um, it really involves a lot more discussion with key stakeholders in each of your verticals, right? Um, if you have a much larger enterprise type of organization, then you're going to have just a few key reports that are then responsible for disseminating, but and also, you know, fomenting that feedback loop of what's coming back up from the different verticals. So 
from a leadership perspective in terms of vision and goals, going outward, making sure everyone is empowered to make decisions um, when it's appropriate, like in a decentralized command type of uh, type of method, um, so that they feel like they have ownership in the changes that are coming. Um, that's a key component. And I think the other part is when it's appropriate to make the decisions yourself and bring the team along on the journey, you have to you have to lay out the breadcrumbs of, hey, here's what we're experiencing and here's the pivots that we're going to be making. What does that look like from your perspective? Whether it's time, whether it's resources, um, whether it's location, um, all those different factors have to be considered. So it's a, a very comprehensive discussion, but you have to be strategic about it. Otherwise, you don't bring people along on the journey and then you lose the, 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 the minor amounts of energy that people might have left, especially if it's been super rocky. So the important thing is just to kind of keep in mind what level you're at in your organization in terms of how many direct reports do you have, how many um, overall individual com contributors do you have, and have a plan for communication at every level. And so everyone knows what the goals are, what the actions are, where it's divert, where it's being diverted, and what that difference looks like so that everyone has that understanding to work off of. And then continue the regular communications of how is this transition working? Let's feedback and create that feedback loop. Um, so I think it's just keeping a mind's eye on where the organization is, how many stakeholders there are, bringing them on the journey first. Well, I absolutely love that the first two responses to this question provided the 20,000 foot view, every organization can apply it kind of broad method and then your response the second response provided this it's nuanced and it's organizational maturity dependent and it is uh, unique to the individual contributors on your team and and uh, how those two things align I hand it over to you Tina to get your perspective and see if we can uh, look at this from even another angle yeah, absolutely. As Kev mentioned, I think it's important to stay true, you know, to what you're doing as an organization and to what Eliza said about empowerment, right? So allowing your teams to set their goals and their buy-in then becomes a part of it, not just what a leader thinks they should be doing, but what are their strengths that they can provide? And, you know, one thing um, I can offer in this regard too is, you know, again, the, the mission, vision, and value should not change in the face of adversity. That's your core, that's your DNA, but your goals are gonna shift and that's okay. If you have to get on a different track, that's okay. And to let people know that they can learn and grow safely in that environment to say, you know what, I had this goal, but it wasn't really on track to where it needed to be based on the change that just happened. And here's what I think we should do instead. So I think that empowerment is very key for leadership to look at when they're placing goals for their teams. I also think it's important to, again, keep that customer in mind. I think sometimes we intro vertically go inside of what we wanna do as an organization and we're not listening externally to making sure that that helps drive our goals as well. A lot of our clients were like, you know, we're struggling understanding how to deploy a worker remotely, when you do that as a company every day, you have all of your employees remotely and then you have internal corporate employees. So how do you do that? And how do you walk them through onboarding an individual remotely and going through technology changes and trials and tribulations? So um, I think that those are some great things to always keep in mind is that it's okay to shift your goals. It's okay to um, make them different. It's okay to say that didn't work. And here's why it didn't work. And here's our lesson we took from that. So I do believe that it's okay to shift again, those priorities and goals. That's what it's about. That's how we grow. That's how we change. Thank you so much, Tina. I think um, you brought up such an important component of this conversation in that change doesn't happen to organizations in a vacuum, exclusively internally or exclusively externally, uh, that change is part of an organization, which itself has a, a culture and itself is going through the experience of the change that's going on. And I think um, that can sometimes be forgotten, that we spend as leaders a tremendous amount of time um, building a brand externally that uh, interacts and engages with consumers in a particular way. And then you have to find a way to maintain those core values and that brand consistency 
while you're pivoting. And you have to find that same way of helping an employee remain engaged when you spend a tremendous amount of time talking with them about the role that their contribution plays to an overall organization. And so when that contribution has to change because of an external factor, how do you keep that employee's energy as Eliza talked about? How do you keep that in, employee engaged and feeling like a valuable contributor to the team um, is a really important dance that our leaders have to go through. So thank you all for those very thoughtful answers. Um, as we move to the next question, um, you know, we're, we're really talking about 2020 um, and the impact of 2020 on business, uh, but we're now a, a month and a half into 2021 and organizations are now in a position where they're starting to begin to think about how do they realign? How do they begin to think about the future again, right? So Tina talked early on about um, many organizations have been very good at being proactive. 2020 taught them how to be good at reactive. Uh, and now we're in a new phase where they have to blend to these things. And so Eliza, coming to you, uh, for organizations that did pivot their business operations in 2020, how do they realign these new priorities, these new initiatives, with their goals and objectives that they had prior to 2020. Yeah, again, I think that's a, a very nuanced and intentional conversation, right? You have to take stock of what went well and what didn't go well and what you learned through that pivot. So what was your original objective? What was the new objective and how it strayed? And also what factors it contributed to, whether it was employee retention, whether it was loss of revenue or increase in revenue, um, whether what it was, I mean, I think there's a lot of businesses that have actually discovered new lines of service that they could implement as a result of, you know, kind of this unforeseen shift in 2020. So I think the important thing is to catalog and capture all those learnings, good or bad, and then start evaluating that against what was your core objective and now where do we wanna go long-term? And I think what Kev mentioned earlier is so important is having a short runway, but then a long runway plan of for at least the next three to six months, steady state looks like X. And we are gonna to stick to X plan because of X, Y, and Z. And the reason why is because you wanna have things that are immeasurable. If you're pivoting your plan every four weeks, every six weeks, that's not gonna be sustainable. You're gonna risk losing a whole bunch more of your staff. You're gonna lose a lot of customers on that journey because you have to envision it like a ship. It takes a lot of time to turn that ship around. And it's really easy for us as leaders and business owners and subject matter experts to be able to make the pivot because we have all the knowledge for the most part. And so if we're, it's easy for us to make that knowledge or to have that knowledge and then act on it, imagine three or four stops down the line, imagine it like a game of telephone, you know, it gets a little discombobulated, you know, the communication has a lot of um, flaws and gaps. So you have to plan a little bit of slack in your, in your trajectory so that people can make the journey, whether it's your customers or it's your staff. And also your service providers, all the, th all the people that are providing your goods, all the people that are providing your technology and your support services, if they're not internal, you're also, there's like three lines right there of just people that you need to make sure you're communicating with. So start with the overall objective and what was the plan, me measure that against where you made changes in 2020, and then create a short runway for the next three to six months, and then a long runway for 12 months plus. And you have to envision what if this sticks around, right? Like it's been almost a year now, we're pretty much there. What if this is the future? Like, what if this is it? What are you going to do today to make sure your business is healthy, sustainable for the long term, and able to expand and start incorporating those um, ideations, those ideas, those iterations into whatever your pivot point was, and then start fleshing out that short and long runway plan? That's what I would suggest. Thank you so much. This incredibly powerful advice. I'm going to come over to you, Kev, and ask you to, to add to this conversation. Uh, Kev, you're Sorry, uh, muted. You, you, yeah, yeah, okay, here I am. <laughs> so um, I think the, um, the main issue is that I'm seeing in nonprofits is, is very few have returned to the uh, the sort of the three to five year planning cycle. Those, those, all those exercises just been suspended and so on. And, and Eliza mentioned a, a, a sort of a short, medium term or longer term 
um, uh, time horizon. Um, and and I was surprised you said the long term was six months. That's short term in nonprofit speak because of the because of the grant cycles and the way they they generate uh, so much money and programs just don't don't change the, uh, that frequently once they're once they're established. But what 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 I think what people are doing now is what what's worked really well in 2020 and what people have continued is the open communication between their board members, uh, the key leaders, the, the communities they serve, and then their key funders and trying to get some um consensus about you know what are the most appropriate next steps for when when things are going to um either return or 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 you know change on some sort of permanent basis and the key thing is where are the people and that means where are your staff uh because some nonprofits have essential workers and others have our are, are, are people are furloughed or people are working from home the people that are served are sometimes not getting anything because they we can't be in touch with them. They can't be served in a digital way, um, or again, certain risks and precautions are being taken. And then there's you know there's other sorts of you know environmental or arts and cultures uh, organizations that can't run their organizations at all. You know they're just they're sort of just shut down and and waiting. And and they may have been able to pivot a little bit with some digital stuff, but they don't know how permanent that is. So it's just so like, where are people in terms of our staffing? Where are the people that we serve? You know, how do we bring these people uh, together in in a you know a semi permanent um, uh, way? That, you know, something that's something that's digital in a, in a semi permanent way. Um, and so those are the things that people are are trying to work through now. And the key thing, of course, with nonprofits is, are they going to be able to generate uh, the income and the impact, uh, however their programming looks like. And so that's what, that's what folks are, are trying to work out. Thank you, Kev. That was a very thorough and thoughtful answer. Um, and one that brought up for me an additional layer to this question, which is, um, you know, to Tina's point from the last answer, there's sort of an internal lens at looking at this and then what systemic changes need to be adopted um, in order to support the new alignment that, that kind of may have come from positive innovation from this change. And so you talked about um, the funding cycle and grants. And I know um, from my interaction with the nonprofit sector, there's tremendous change taking place right now in how grants are being evaluated and how to get access um, and funding out to organizations that are doing impact work. Uh, and some of this change has created uh, some systems that people thought of as temporary, uh, but are so positive that I think organizations are going to have to uh, figure out how to maintain them and, and make them part of the new normal. And so as I hand this over to you, Tina, I'll, I'll ask you to speak to the question of how do they realign the priorities, but I'll also ask you to look at it from the lens of um, within the context of this new normal. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's interesting when you think about um, virtual doctor's appointments now. And, and to me, I'm like, wow, why didn't we think of that earlier? What a, what a concept to not go into a hospital where everybody is sick and you're already not feeling well and be exposed to it versus being able to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with your doctor and, and what efficiencies that might bring um, my sister and my niece are doctors. And, and they're like, this is actually such a great impact to our business of customer care, right? So I, I think of how the medical field just got changed and had to do shifts and realign their strategic priorities. Um, I also think of many other um, areas where, you know, remote workforces, I've always been remote for the last eight years in business transformation. And now it's opened up the eyes to many other companies. Salesforce just announced it today. I think Cisco was another one that announced that they're not going back to what was normal. They're now offering flex schedules. They're now considering that this might be the new norm. And so I think and taking what Kev said, Eliza is, you know, you had a five-year plan. So take the five-year plan, take the three-year plan, whatever it might be, align it with what you had from 2020, and then look at strategically what you want to accomplish in 2021. Is that you need to continue to reduce costs? Is it that you need to drive your revenue? What, what avenue do you need to go down and then adjust accordingly? Um, and then I think it's also ensuring that everybody understands again through that clear communication what that is and is able to say 
hey, you know what, this is actually some good things that have come out of it. And here's how we're going to change our business related to that. But again, making sure also that we still look at what is the core fundamental ability we had five years ago? And why couldn't we somehow incorporate that into what we're doing today in a different way? Um, you know, we can still hire people remotely. We can still have conversations. I mean, look at the world of opening even video conferencing, um, being remote for so many years. We talked constantly via video conferencing, but we never turned on the camera. We just talked. And so it's fascinating to me now that I'm like, why didn't we think of ever turning on the camera before and showing people this is who we are. This is our life. This is the dog just barked. The door just rang because Amazon's delivering something because I can't shop like I used to. It's okay. And so let's strategically align our business around what does the business need to do and looking at that priority list and checking it off that way and staying more micro. I think macro right now isn't the way to go. It's staying micro with your business and ready to pivot as you need to and adjusting to new norms. Wow, what a powerful conversation today. And I feel each of these answers, um, there could be a very helpful five-step article written out of uh, that I think would bring a lot of value. You mentioned mantra earlier. I think we could have a, a weekly uh, leadership takeaway from the session. You've been incredible. And we've had many audience questions come in because of the value that you're bringing. Uh, one question that came up from the audience we were talking uh, related to communication. Uh, so the themes of uh, leadership consistency uh, and leadership cadence came up in multiple answers. Um, and one of our audience members asked, um, is there a right frequency? Is there over communication? What is the right cadence for a leader to be articulating a message? And I'll leave it to all of you to chime in. So, Kev. Yeah, like so I want, I want to jump in right there because I've done a lot of organizational change management. And one of the first things I always hear from people is, oh, um, I don't know, we're, 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 you can't over communicate. We have to communicate. Um, you can actually over communicate, uh, particularly if it does not involve listening. And that's what communication often means from people in, in the boardroom or in the project team. They mean communicate, they mean pushing out messages. And you can clearly overdo that. <laughs> um, if, however, you can't sort of over converse in, in that sense. I mean, if you are genuinely um, listening. So, so I think the, the, the point about communication is um, being clear that it's got to be multi-channel. You know, there's got to be ways where you're listening to people. Uh, people want to people consume and share their thoughts in different ways. And, and the best communication strategies uh, provide staff and other stakeholders with multiple opportunities to learn, opportunities to share, opportunities to safely cogitate and ask and like, you know, just sense check in a, in a you know, blame-free way while they work it, work it out. And when, when, you're at, when, you know, when you answer a question over this part of an organization, that, that answer is available to someone else. And, and that infrastructure isn't easy to, to set up. Uh, typically, most organizations do not have good internal communication structures. Um, and, and it's often a, a, a change process that, that uh, forces the need to create that. But, but, but the idea of that, of communication, I just like to unpack and it's gotta be multi-channel, multi-direction and as much listening as there is messaging. I agree with that, Kev. Um, one thing we did was we created an innovation portal that is open for anybody to go in and post ideas or innovation that they're thinking of or wanting to communicate. And it's a safe place for us as leaders to look at what are those ideas for maybe the person, as you mentioned, multiple channels and ways to communicate. Not everybody wants to be on a town hall and speak their mind. Um, so offering those different channels, I think, is also just as important as frequency to consider that. So sometimes I think people just think being on a call and whether I do it once a week, twice a week, three times a week, um, consider other avenues and channels to have that communication. And maybe then it's not, seems like it's too much that you're over communicating by constantly having a town hall where it's one-sided maybe, or somebody's talking and they're not allowing some dialogue. So we had town halls, but then right after that meeting, we broke out into breakout groups to talk about 
what the town hall message meant from our leadership. So it was very powerful. And, and, and again, go micro. Yeah. Um, I would also add, which both of you, obviously, I think that's exactly like what I would have said. The other thing that I would say is, especially in times of challenge, you have to plan more time to communicate than less. So I think Kev is exactly right. Like there is a too much communication, but I also think that we teach our staff and we teach our organizations how to treat us by the expectations that we set. So for example, if we tend to over communicate already, I think it's important to make sure that you're still consistent because you've trained people to expect that from you. And so when you make a shift and you stop communicating, that creates emotional instability in your teams. So I think you have to reflect on what you've done historically and know what your team already expects and where you have ability to build in a structure, then create a structure of, you know what, I don't talk to my team as frequently as I need to be. So now is the time to start building in the plan for maybe once a week on XYZ channel is the appropriate mechanism or whatever the structure is for when you talk on what channel and what you're going to say. I think another component to when you communicate is also how you communicate. So I think especially when stress is high, lots of changes are happening, you have to, from a leadership perspective, be able to explain exactly what's happening, what the ramifications are, what the risks are, but also what the potential rewards are in a language that the individual, the individual contributor at the entry level can understand it without fighting to understand. Because if you can mm -hmm. explain it from the top to the bottom, where everyone can absorb what you're saying instantly and feel feel confident, then you create additional streams of communication um, in your team saying, okay, I heard it from XYZ channel, or I read it in this email, or I was in the town hall. And now there's additional upwards communication of, did I hear that right? Am I misunderstanding XYZ? So I think doing a lot of front end planning on, am I explicitly clear from the top to the bottom exactly what we're doing here? And if there's any confusion, working extremely diligently to be as clear as possible so that there, you risk as minimal confusion as possible. I think a lot of times, especially at scale in larger organizations, that's where leaders really mess up is they're talking only from their horizon level and they don't think down mm -hmm. to the organization. And also externally for the customer, they do the same thing. It's dangerous when you make assumptions that people just know that's who we are. But you have to assume that anyone you're talking to doesn't know. So lay the steps out, be explicit and clear, use smaller words, use shorter sentences so they don't have to fight to understand and you don't lose them along the way. Well, this is such a powerful conversation and we said that we would listen at the end and give the audience the opportunity to ask some live questions. So for those of you who've been asking in the chat, um, we've had some of our panelists answering back in the chat, but I'd love to open it up for a final last live question. Uh, if there's anybody in our audience who'd like to ask one out loud. You are muted in the audience, but you should have the opportunity to unmute if you'd like to just go ahead and ask a live question. And if not, uh, I'll, I'll ask each of the panelists to provide, if you could only listen to one podcast, watch one webinar, or read one book, you can choose your channel because people are neurodiverse um, about this topic, which one would it be? And I'll start with you, Tina. Um, you know, I said it in the very beginning. I'm a huge believer in your thoughts and what you believe you can and cannot accomplish really dictate a lot of your strategy, both personally and professionally. And by far, one of my absolute favorite books that really changed me professionally and personally was by Dr. Dyer, and it's called The Power of Intention. Amazing book. And I, I still amaze myself when I find myself going down the wrong way and the wrong thoughts, I twist it around and it's within days or weeks that the epiphany happens. And I'm like, there it is, that power of intention. So I'll leave that with everyone and a favorite quote, courage is what takes to stand up and speak, but courage is also what it takes to sit down and listen. Thank you so much, Tina. Kev. Um, love I've been more. listening, I've been listening a lot recently to, um, Jim Fortin, uh, who talks a lot about, uh, time 
and, and the perception of time. Um, again, you can imagine in nonprofits, people have a scarcity mindset around money. And I keep telling them, oh, there's plenty of that. What you don't have is, you know, you physically do not have more time. So you're, the, way to, the way to create more is really your perception of it and talking about aligning your purpose and your energy, uh, not trying to um, solve that, those bigger problems by um, uh, fighting the clock or, or trying to address um, using apps and everything around scheduling, because that's the sort of micro piece of it. You really need to align your, your purpose and energy first um, and, and understand what, what time really offers you. Uh, and, I've, and so Jim Fortune, I can't remember the name of his um, podcast, it might just be the Jim Fortune show. I honestly don't remember, um, but um, you can find him online, Jim Fortune, F-O-R-T-I-N. I don't have a sexy thing, hey. sorry. <laughs> Uh, Eliza, I'd, I'd love to hear yours. Yeah, first of all, I am. I worked in publishing for one of my main consulting gigs was in working in publishing for over a decade. So I am a voracious reader, but I have some core books that I go back to and re I revisit every year, no matter what, because they're so fundamental to me. One of them is called The Wisest One in the Room. Um, and it really is, um, so the, the byline, and I pulled it up just so I could read it to you. So it's how you can benefit from social psychology's most powerful insight. And I think when you're in business in general, as a human, you're working along other people. Um, we are intrinsically in a world of social uh, interaction. So whether we're in business, whether we're just dealing with our families, dealing with each other, there's so many different dynamics. But so important to make sure that we understand uh, how to leverage them, when to be quiet, when to read others, others' emotions, and to do that from a position of wisdom and not from a position of authority or, you know, um, dictatorship or, you know, any, any of those kinds of things. So this is one of my favorite books. I've read it, like I said, every year for about five years now. Um, and I just think it's a super powerful read. So the wisest one in the room. Well, thank you all for this incredible conversation. I want to be respectful of everyone's time, uh, but as it always happens at the end of Business Bites, I could stay on all day talking with all of you. So um, this has been a powerful conversation. I feel like I've been with three of the wisest ones uh, in this space. So thank you all for your contributions. I'll hand it back to Brian to close this out for today. Awesome. Thank you, Kelly. Um, that was such an amazing conversation. Thank you. So huge. Thank you to the panelists for taking time of their day uh, for coming out for Business Bites. Um, I'm very for sure all our audience members really appreciate it. Um, and again, I'll be linking down below um, the feedback survey and also the link to our next Business Bites happening on March 10th. Uh, so if you did enjoy the session, uh, please do uh, see you next time next month. Um, and if you have any feedback, please let us know. Um, again, thank you so much to the speaker. Thank you, Kelly, for moderating. Um, we're very excited to keep going with Business Bites for 2021. Thank you. <laughs>